I started when I left school. I went as a blacksmith. As a head blacksmith, I went as a motor mechanic. But after two years, I got fired, and I was out of work. And uh, I saw a job advertise for a welder, and it was a peel engineer. And, and I, I applied. I said, "Look, I can't weld, but I'll learn." And they said, "Fair enough." And they took me on, and I went to night school and all the rest of it, and finished up. I was a, a qualified welder. So that's how it came about. It was good. Yeah, yeah. I don't suppose you appreciated it quite as much as the time as you do when you're thinking back on it. But yeah, it, it was it was a good it was a good thing. It was very very interesting. You you covered so much stuff. You you'd never do it anywhere else. You know. But he was eccentric. Uh, very hard to get to know. You, you, you didn't know what was in his head. You didn't know much about him. He kept himself to himself. Uh, even in his private life, he did. You know, and he, he sort of stayed in the office a lot. And uh, yeah, you didn't know. You didn't know what he was thinking or what was going on with him. You know, I found out after years he was a quite different person to what you. You thought he was, a, you know, very. He was a genius, obviously, you know, and way ahead of his time. Uh, I think he went to America to learn about fiberglass when it first came out, and, and, and so he came back, and he was top man in fiberglass. I think there was nobody in England who could touch him in, in, when it came to fiberglass. But he was a pilot in the war. He. he, he he started off as an air, air fitter, a frame fitter, on, on, on um, Ark Royal in the war. And he, he applied to be a pilot. And they turned him down because of his eyesight. Anyway, as the war got on and the pilots were getting scarcer, suddenly the eyesight became better. <laughs> and they took him. So he trained to fly, you know, and he was flying hurricanes and spitfires and various things and he finished up as a uh, train, training officer for, for training people to fly anything from Lancaster's uh, bombers and all this lot. So he was pretty switched on and you know he, he, he was a good engineer obviously and he was pretty quick and with his reactions obviously you know so yeah, it's, yeah, you couldn't get a better fella for you know for, for really you know that with the, with the inventive mind, you've cracked it, haven't you? He was a genius, there's no question about it, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, th I don't think he knew it all in his head, but he, if he had an idea, he would get the right books and the right information so he knew it, you know, and, and yeah, he, yeah, he wasn't scared to tackle things, you know. It was, it was just before my time when he started doing the fairings. Um, but when I I joined then, the, the, the TT week was, well, the, leading up to TT, several weeks, there would be, all the top stars of the day would be down, booked in to get fairness fitted to their bikes. And again, way ahead of his time with that one too, really, you know. There was only people that had fairness with the big works teams that made their own fairness for their bikes, but the ordinary, uh, lads that, that didn't have a works, and I mean a works bike like an MV or a Jaleera or something like that. All the Nortons and VSAs and AGSs and all that lot, they didn't have fairings. They all more or less came from here. And then there was a few people started copying them, of course, but that's gonna happen, isn't it? You know, but uh, yeah, they were never as good, the copies they were. Fairing, it's a streamline and it fits on the front of a, a motorbike, or a motorbike, a sidecar in some cases, um, which reduces the, the um, hindrance of the air on the, on, the, on the bike, you know. So it was good for another maybe five or ten mile an hour, but yeah, yeah. making it more slippery through the air, really, yeah. I don't know if it was ahead of his time or not. It was, it was something completely different. That was, that was for certain. The, the idea of it was, it was, it was going to be a, a covered scooter because everybody them days were buying scooters. That was the craze. And uh, this idea was, yeah, the wife could go and 
get in it and take a kid to school. Or, well, not not in the P50, but in the P50, you can go and get a shopping and come back and no problem at all. Like, you know, keep them dry. That was the idea of it. Uh, and yeah, it did catch on, there's no doubt about it. it uh, there was bits of problems with it, obviously, which caused it not to be, to, to just stop getting done, really, you know. But that that was outside Siddle's control. There was no fault of his. It was it was the engine, that, which was a, which was a DKW, which was a German, well, it was in German, the other side of the Iron Curtain in them days, you know, it was a man, the manufacturers were, which didn't make it very easy to, to get spares or get things and people were we used to having cars and ordinary motorbikes and things and as a result they were forgetting to put the oil in the petrol and that was the biggest problem with them and it, you know it was the demise of them, of them and to try it in the end you know it was it, you couldn't keep going you couldn't couldn't get the engines quick enough for you couldn't get the spare parts and you couldn't afford to be fixing them neither for nothing because people were coming back under warranty uh, even though it wasn't his, it was their doing really by not putting oil in, but you know, I don't know. That's, that's what happened anyway, you know, but uh, it was, they were, they were good little things. You had to, you had to drive them with respect. Because uh, you could do wheelies on them very easy, you know, two wheels anyway, you know. And, and, and if you didn't intend to do it, you were in trouble, you know. Yeah, it, 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 it got a lot of interest, you know. I don't think all the interest followed up with, with sales, unfortunately, but there was a lot of, lot of interest, you know. Not a clue. I wish I knew. I wish you'd have known then what was going to happen. You can, I can tell you that. I had one or two tucked away, but... I know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, can't, I really can't get my head around it. Why, you know? And I've met, I've met some of these guys that paid long thousands for them, you know. And uh, can't can't figure out why they did it. But they do. And there you go. Yeah, the, yeah, the Trident was, yeah, was, was an extra seat. And uh, it had a dome on the top, a bubble. Uh, so it was a real bubble car, really. I mean, if, if all the bubble cars that was made, there was nothing that was like a bubble as that was. That was the nearest thing to it. And uh, it had used the same engine, the same components. It was just a different body. And uh, it, it, that was fine, again, yeah. But a little bit hot in there and the sun was shining. It was a bit like a greenhouse, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. So Siddle was, was, was using plastic to, to, to form into windscreens for most of the motorbike fairings in the first place, you know. And uh, they were clear. There was no image, you know, you could spot on. You could, and ICI couldn't understand how he was getting them without any marks on them, you know. And the secret was that he was actually make, made a, 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 like a frame cut out, lay the plastic above it and heat it. A uh, layer of plastic below it, heat it, and would blow it up into a bubble. And he'd have a piece on the top, so when it came up and touched it, that was the right height, you know. And, and it just blew sort of a natural bubble. He cut it in half, and he had two windscreens for the pheasants, which were, because they'd been sucked into a mold like most of them were doing, and of course when they would touch the mold, it, affected the vision of the, you know, when you look through them. This was crystal clear. And an uh, ICI had to, had to come and check to see how the hell he was managing to do this because they couldn't, they didn't have a clue, you know. And that's how he did the big bubbles for the, for the, the Trident as well. He, he just made a massive big thing and blew these things up. And yeah, it was, it was, but that's his idea again and made everything for doing it, you know. No, didn't buy a thing in to do it. No, no, we'll make it and invent it ourselves, you know that. Yeah, I'm very proud of being there, you know. Uh, I think I was extremely lucky. Yeah, more lucky than I realised at the time. I, I did enjoy it when I was there, and I did realise what, what a cracking job it was. But looking back at it now, yeah, I, it, it was 
there's no, I don't think you could have been anywhere else where you would have had such a variety of things and such responsibility put on you because you were, a, you were involved in the development to a certain extent. You know, if you come up with an idea, it, it, it was well looked at and maybe put in, uh, used, you know. So, you, you know, you had a good input into it. And I can't think of many jobs where it's like that. You, you usually you're making something because the designers have said, this is what we want. But there you could actually help in the design to a certain extent. That was good, very good. I know about the hovercraft. I didn't know about it when it was getting made. It was, I think Siddle kept that pretty secret. I don't know whether George knew anything about it or not, but I certainly didn't. And some of the others that I worked with knew nothing about it. We'd, we'd obviously been making parts for it, which would be a piece of paper with a drawing on, and when you make this, we didn't know what we were doing. And uh, in the old mill over there, where, they were, where the engineering side of it was, there was a, a big floors, the three stories, three stories, yeah, and a massive big trap door in the middle that came out. So when they would, would do whatever they were doing in the mill, they could obviously lower the stuff up and down and all this lot. And Siddle decided to build this on the top floor, kept the door locked, you couldn't go in to see what was going on. And uh, first I knew about it was this hell of a noise and dust and things flying around, and he'd started it up on the top floor and it was blowing the dust through all the cracks. That, ah, yeah, that's, that's, that's where it started. And it worked, and it worked without a skirt as well. And Hovercraft today, all have to have a skirt seeming to be, but this actually worked without a skirt. I, I don't know why he didn't go any further with it. I don't know, that was a shame, because I think it would have done well. Yeah, but there you go.